Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Systems Change Deep Dive podcast, where we take a systemic look at some of the greatest social, economic, and environmental challenges that we are facing as a global community, and also to the ideas and projects that have the potential to catalyze systems change. For the first season, we will be looking into the issue of carbon capture as a response to the climate crisis. Uh, we'll be hearing from experts from around the world that are working on different approaches and solutions to carbon capture and beyond. Today, we welcome Joel Salatin, co-owner of the Polyface Farm in Virginia. Uh, Joel calls himself a Christian, libertarian, environmentalist, capitalist, lunatic farmer. Others who like him call him the most famous farmer in the world, the high priest of the pasture, and the most eclectic thinker from Virginia since Thomas Jefferson. Um, he has a room full of debate trophies. He has published 15 books and is running a thriving multi-generational family farm, drawing on a lifetime of food, farming, and fantasy to entertain and inspire audiences around the world. He is as comfortable moving cows in a pasture as addressing CEOs in a Wall Street business conference. He co-owns uh, with his family, the Polyface Farm in Sewell, Virginia, which has been featured in the New York Times bestseller, Omnivore's Dilemma, and the award-winning documentary, Food Inc. And this farm services more than 5,000 families, 50 restaurants, 10 retail outlets, um, and the farmer's market with a variety of products. Uh, when Joel is not on the road speaking, he is at home on the farm, keeping the calluses in his hands and dirt under his fingernails, uh, mentoring young people, inspiring visitors, and promoting the local regenerative food and farming systems. Uh, Joel is also the editor of the Stockman Grass Farmer, writes several magazine columns, co-hosts a podcast titled Beyond Labels, is a frequent guest on radio programs and podcasts such as this one, and he writes a blog called The Musings from the Lunatic Farmer. So welcome, Joel. Thank you so much for being here today on the podcast. I wanted to start the interview by asking you what inspired you or motivated you to do the work that you do. Well, you know, when I was a little uh, child, we we came to the farm. Mom and dad uh, uh, bought this property in 1961. I was just four years old and it was a gullied rock pile, uh, arguably the worst piece of property in the whole region. And for, for many reasons, I won't go into all the details of why, but uh, but it was it was in really bad shape. And uh, my grandfather lived in Indiana and was an avid uh, backyard gardener, had a pretty large, you know, like a quarter acre uh, garden, which is pretty big. And he was an early uh, adherent to Rodale's Organic Gardening and Farming magazine in 1940, whatever, 48, 49, had a large compost pile, an octagonal chicken house and had, you know, berries and, and all this. And, and he had this, this T-top trellis around the, um, around the garden that when I was just, you know, seven, eight years old, we'd go up there to visit late in the summer. And these, these grapes would be, be hanging in, in just succulent, uh, succulent lumps, you know, big clusters off of these. And, and as a little child, I could, I could just barely reach up, you know, and get these, uh, get these grapes and, and of course ate all I could eat. And, uh, and, and um, the, the, the disparity between his uh, verdant black soil and our rock pile clay clods and gullies, um, uh, you know, looking back on it, struck me that is it possible to make our place like grandpa? Is, is it possible to do here, you know, what, what he had there? And, um, and so, you know, I got my first chickens when I was 10 years old, uh, fell in love with, you know, with, with the farm, with animals and all that. And, um, and dad was a, a visionary, very much ahead of his time, and was all about uh, trying to, to, to bring back a healing, to regenerate this, um, th this piece of land. And so, um, so in my lifetime, I've watched it go from, you know, from, from rocks and, and infertility 
to arguably the, the most, uh, certainly the most abundant farm in the community. And I, I'm not saying that proudly, I'm saying that humbly recognizing that nature's templates do work, uh, given enough time and given enough persistence, uh, they, they do work. And so the joy of my life is to have been, you know, to have been a, a, a participant, a, a, a participant in that healing. It's not something that you have to be a, um, a, a non-participatory bystander. You, you can actually uh, uh, viscerally touch, you know, touch the earth, touch the land and, uh, and, and watch it respond. And that's a, that's a joy. That's a wonderful story and wonderful inspiration also. Uh, I want to wonder if you could maybe explain a little bit about your approach to this issue of carbon capture. So in your farm, you have uh, animal rotations. I was wondering if you could explain the system that you've created. Yeah, thank you uh, for that um, opening, because as you know, especially cows have received a tremendous amount of uh, negative uh, you know, <laughs> publicity in the, you know, in, in the carbon conversation. And so, um, so what we're trying, what, what's important, I think, to real, to remember is that the planet had way more megafauna on it a thousand years ago than it does today. And so it must not be the animals that's the problem. It must be something about how the animals are managed. And so uh, early on, um, dad got a hold of some material from the Frenchman, Andre Voisin, uh, who wrote Grass Productivity, which is still kind of the, it's still kind of the Bible of, of uh, controlled grazing. And, and what he pointed out there, uh, he was also the catalyst for Alan Savory's work uh, in holistic management. And uh, what he pointed out there was the time element in grazing. And of course, nature does this on the, you know, on the Serengeti, on the American Plains uh, with, 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 you know, fire, seasonality and, and predators, wolves here in America, and of course, lions in, in Africa. And of course, there were predators in other areas as well. Um, but that, but, but that, that movement. And so what that does is that it stimulates through, through uh, strategic pruning, it stimulates the, the perennial uh, prairie, the grasses, the forbs, the, all that to actually produce more than it would if it, if it just went into senescence. Um, carbon capture when we talk about, you know, the most efficient biomass to, to, carb, to capture carbon and put it in the soil, um, you know, people think about trees as being, you know, the, the biggest carbon sink, but actually the most, the, the fastest way is through grasses because their metabolism is so much faster than trees. Now it's counterintuitive because when you look at the forest, you say, well, look at all that carbon, but you're seeing you know, 30, 40, 50, 60 years of carbon storage above ground, you don't see that in, in prairie, in grasslands. Um, but if you, if you took your lawn clippings and you were able to, you know, uh, uh, take a square, a square meter of those lawn clippings, put them in a box and put that box in a, in a storage shed. And in 60 years, we opened that door and said, here, here is the carbon that came off of that square meter it would make a believer out of you, uh, you know, to, to see it all in one place. Well, when these, when these grasses uh, grow, they create bilateral symmetry at the soil horizon. So there's, there's as much carb, there's as much biomass vegetative material below the soil as there is above the soil. So as that plant, it starts to grow, it's, it's in a, it's in a sigmoid curve. And so it starts to grow slowly, then it goes through a very rapid uh, accelerated growth, and then it, then it slows down into senescence. So I call the first stage diaper grass, teenage grass, and then nursing home grass, okay, to try to get the, the three, you know, uh, tiers of, of production. And so uh, the whole idea of, of, of nature's system 
with the the choreography of movement across these prairies with these you know uh, large ungulates was um, to to prune it prune it back so that it could freshen it up and start the regrowth cycle but then leave it and rest until it regrew to that second tier the problem with with livestock around the world especially herbivores is overgrazing uh, is twofold one is overgrazing to where you know that the, they there's not enough rest period for the for the forages to regrow and capture solar energy um and, and carbon and and put it back into the soil through the roots that's number one number two is of course now uh with cheap grain we actually take a lot of these herbivores off of perennials and put them on annuals in feedlots and annuals annuals actually deplete carbon perennials increase carbon the energy the, the, the perennial the energy flow of a perennial is down into the ground the energy flow of an annual is up out so so when when people say well, we need we need to you know get rid of these we need to all go you know vegan and eat squash and watermelon instead of you know uh, uh beef what they're not recognizing is that if it, that if every plant were as efficient as a squash or a watermelon or a soybean we wouldn't have any soil because it is the it is the the um, the organic matter that's pumped in by perennials that actually built those soils. Those legacy soils that we are now monocropping with corn and soybeans and wheat and rye. Those legacy soils were not built with either chemical fertilizer or mon or, or annuals. They were built with perennials that we are still we still have the privilege of mining those legacy organic matter sinks in the soil and we're and we're depleting it and so and so uh using using high technology uh electric fence we're able to literally steer the the pruners <laughs> these four-legged pruners we're actually able to steer them across the landscape with the same precision as a zero turn mower on a golf course. That's never been possible in human history. And the result is that we can very carefully monitor the moment, the, the pruning moment in a given uh, forage plant. And, and um, in other words, we can say, uh, no, you can't get that clover tomorrow, uh, today. You have to wait till tomorrow, you know, and, and, and then we can move them off and rest everything so that at any one time, only a tiny, tiny portion of the, uh, of the landscape is being uh, pruned. Most of it is at rest. And, and that creates a mosaic across the landscape. So there's always something growing rapidly there's always something heading into senescence there's always something in blossom and that stimulates pollinators spiders uh insects moles voles and the the entire uh cornucopia of life uh that's in that that's in that uh biosystem well what has this done uh for for, for us uh so in in you know, we've been here now 60 years and um, the, it, we have moved our organic matter in our soils from 1% organic matter in 1961 on average to now a little more than 8% organic matter. So now I know, I know that organic matter and carbon are not, you know, scientifically synonymous, but, but, but they're very close. They're, 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 they're cousins. Uh, if, if you, if you want if you want to put carbon in the soil and you're interested in putting carbon in the soil, you want to increase the organic matter. They, 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 they go, they go uh, hand in hand. And so, um, so the, the joy of being able to know that we have actually increased that organic matter to that extent is, is quite amazing. Uh, and and it, it has uh, major ramifications. One pound of organic matter holds four pounds of water. Every 1% organic matter increases water retentive capacity by 20,000 gallons per acre. 
So if we so if we go from one percent to eight percent organic matter, that's seven percentage points times twenty thousand gallons per acre is one hundred and forty thousand gallons per acre of water that our soil can now hold that it couldn't hold back in 1961. Uh, and and what and and of course what that does is make springs begin to flow. It, it it hydrates the landscape. It reduces droughts. It reduces flooding. You know all those kinds of things. So it's a you know it's a it's a multifaceted um, you know uh, uh, ramification. Yeah. Um, thanks for that really thorough explanation. And I'm curious though is is it also possible to do it with other animals? Because for example here in Portugal. Um, you know, cows aren't the most advisable because we have very thin soil, so they compact it. But there's a very long tradition of sheep, um, goats, and also raising pigs under um, cork oak production. Yes, ab absolutely. So all, all of our animals are on pasture, absolutely. Um, and all of them have just you know, a little bit of, of different characteristic. But all of our animals get moved uh, very routinely. We, uh, you know, kind of our centerpiece enterprise is actually poultry, uh, meat, meat chickens, broilers. They're in they're in uh, portable portable field shelters, and they're 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 small modules. Uh, they're they're ten feet by twelve feet by two feet high. Uh, I can't put that in centimeters, but but anyway, um, uh, twelve by two by by uh, twelve by ten by two. So one person can move them. And we put 75 in each one and we can move them uh, on pretty rugged ground, actually, because, you know, they're small modules and uh, they're floorless. So the chickens are on pasture. We move them every single day to a new spot, like a like a fleet of migrating you know, geese across the landscape. And um, and and that, uh, you know, really, really brings on. I mean, obviously, the chickens are leaving, you know, fertility behind. And um, uh, it, it really uh, changes the landscape dramatically. So yes, we run turkeys and chickens and ducks and sheep and cows and pigs and, and everything um, is moved uh, routinely. A lot of people ask me, well, you know, how did you innovate these systems? And so the answer is very simple that when you look at nature, animals move. You know, we live, we live in a culture in which it's assumed that animals don't have to move. We, you know, we put them in cages and uh, put them in these big houses, and they they don't need to move anywhere. Um, and 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 in, in nature, one of the things you see pretty quickly is <laughs> that that animals do move. Uh, and and so um, as soon as you as soon as you assume well animals move, then obviously you have to have. Uh, some sort of a control mechanism so they don't get on the neighbor's property or, you know, uh, head down, down, downtown to the, you know, coffee shop. Um, and, and uh, so you have to have a control and obviously you have to have water, uh, you know, for them in, in, in all their little, their little paddocks. And so probably, probably the most um, unknown, uh, unappreciated development here on our farm is we have eight miles of buried water line uh, from permaculture, permaculture style high ponds up in valleys that gravity flows water down um, and gives us pressurized clean water over the entire farm. Um, you know, uh, every, every access point is about a hundred meters apart on the edge of the field. So we have pressurized, no, no electricity, no pumps, it's just gravity flows. And, um, and so, you know, you have to have portable water, portable shelter, you know, so, so all of our shelters, we have, you know, shade mobiles and, and, and for, for cows, turkeys, pigs, uh, chickens, you know, uh, they all have these portable, uh, portable shade structures, which give them comfort like a portable shade tree, but it also allows us to place their droppings, their manure and urine. It allows us to strategically place their droppings right where we want them. You know, there's a rock, uh, you know, a, a bramble bush, a weed or something, okay? And so we can say, today, uh, you're all gonna poop right here, you know? And, and, and we, we can strategically place that uh, where it will do the most good. Yeah, that's incredible. Um, and 
I understand that your your farm is quite a productive business also. So maybe you could run us a little bit about all the kinds of products that you can are able to get on your farm. Obviously not an extensive list, but just all the things that you were able to produce there in a sustainable way. Sure, sure. So so you know we have we have beef, and uh, then we have uh, the broiler chicken, a meat chicken. We produce eggs, um, and then we have uh, rabbit. Um, so these are these are pastured rabbits. They're actually out on we move them every day, you know, along the, the grass. Um, uh, right now we have ducks duck for duck eggs as well. Um, we raise turkeys, so pastured turkeys, and uh, pigs are in the pigs are not in the nice fields. The pigs are kind of in in forestal edges. Um, you know, more like the, the, the De La Hesa, uh, you know, the De he in, uh, in, in, and, and in Portugal as well. Um, and so, you know, we raise them kind of through the woods uh, that we, we open up to get kind of a, a silvo pasture uh, where you have widely spaced trees and grass underneath. Very, very beautiful, as you know, you know that, uh, that technique quite well. Um, and then we, in addition to that, we uh, we have a sawmill so we are actually milling you know we mill lumber for our own projects as well as uh, to sell we sell firewood uh, we one of the most important things that we do is we create our own um, our own wood chips for composting for large-scale composting so in the winter um, like right now today we you know we're we're uh, what are we minus um, about minus 10 centigrade. So we're 10 degrees Fahrenheit here today and snow. And uh, so we're feeding hay. When we feed hay, we feed in a, in a shed, a roofed shed cover with, um, with a, what we call a carbonaceous diaper uh, underneath the animals to absorb the manure and urine. We add corn to it, the, the, the pressure of the animals uh, presses out the oxygen so that whole bedding pack which might be you know a meter a meter deep uh, is full of of fermenting corn then when the, when the animals come out in the spring we put the pigs in the pigs seek the fermented corn and aerate it injecting oxygen and it goes from anaerobic to aerobic compost and that is our that is our fertilizer program well where do those wood chips come from those wood chips come from strategic uh, weeding in the woodlot, uh, uh, disease trees, uh, crooked trees. You know, upgrading the upgrading the woods. Um, that that is our that is our fertilizer budget. So rather than rather than spending on you know chemical 10, 10, 10 fertilizer, we're we're putting that money instead in our own uh, our own carbon generation uh, uh, program. And, um, and, and so we, so we close that, we, we integrate the forest and the open land, which gives us both fungi and bacteria in the soil. Um, uh, grasses tend to like bacteria, trees tend to like fungi, but the best soil has both bacteria and fungi. So actually integrating the forestal and the and the pastoral at landscape actually creates the most diverse microbial community, um, which which makes a more what stable and abundant biology, which is you know what we're after in the soil. Um, and and then beyond that, we also we also tap maple trees. So we have uh, maple syrup. We have um, we have honeybee uh, hives hives of, of honeybees. So we have honey and, um, you know, uh, just anything that we can, that we can cobble together to, you know, add things here on the farm is, is good. We, we've, in the past, we've even sold, um, we've even sold rocks for, <laughs> for, uh, you know, uh, people, for urban people that want to decorate their, you know, their landscaping with rocks. So um, uh, if we can find something to sell, we try to figure out how to sell it. Very resourceful. Um, so listening to all of this, so I would 
really like to know like the impact that all of this has um in the local economy how do you like how do you feel that your activities are supporting the local economy in your community yeah well it's a it's a pretty big deal uh we we call ourselves the the economic reversal or the economic inversion in other words we're bringing money from the city to the country the the normal industrial system uh brings er, brings rural money to the urban sector it's it's like the urban sector is constantly you know the, the, like it's like far uh, uh agricultural lands are economically hemorrhaging hemorrhaging uh you know uh their their wealth to the cities and we would like to see uh that reversed and so um and so we we uh, we bring that to the farm i think the um, and and the spin off is is pretty big i mean uh uh so you know we spend i don't know we spend um close to a million dollars a year probably just in uh in gmo free grain from local gmo free uh, grain farmers so these are folks who so we pay extra for that gmo and um and and they and that reduces the amount of land that's getting chemicals um and and roundup and things like that and 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 patronizes those farms as well so so that is patronizing you know a, a fair amount of acreage um that that's being protected from the chemical industrial approach um our animals of course need to all be uh, uh processed and so we are a major uh a major economic part of the local abattoir the the the, the butchering uh infrastructure in the community uh that's that's here and then you know we we employ um you know uh, uh people we employ a mechanic a full-time mechanic to keep all our machinery running a full-time maintenance technician to keep our you know the roofs on the buildings and 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 you know fix fix um uh, you know structures and and build things um so there's a there's you know a couple of uh, you know several part time salespeople who are on commission who, who make phone calls and do sales, uh, drive you know delivery vehicles, delivery trucks, um, and and then in addition to that, we have about fifteen thousand visitors a year who come from all over the world to see what we're doing. And uh, we, do, we do a lot of classes, educational uh, classes. We're now offering um, the farm as a gathering platform for groups who wanna get together and don't wanna do it at a, at, a, at a conference center. There's a huge demand now for alternative meeting places because of COVID and mask mandates and vaccine mandates and all that. There's a huge demand now for a more uh, whatever natural open air oriented uh, um, you know venue for for uh, for uh, people to get together people still want to get together they just don't want to do it in air conditioning and hvac systems and in an enclosed uh, space and so um, we kind of uh, we kind of inaugurated this last year and it was extremely well received uh, and so we're we're upgrading and, and moving forward with more um more outfits we call them gatherings um and, and they're not you know some are some are wellness oriented some are economic oriented some are self-improvement oriented i mean we just want businesses and organizations both prof for profit and non-profit to know that if they if they want to get together um uh, what better place than on a farm and what better food to eat than our own food so we can we can provide great you know world class food for them which then spends money to local uh people who grow things that we don't grow you know produce and gardens and fruit and things like that dairy uh so you know we provide an outlet for you know for everything from you know from fruit to apple juice to dairy to cheese to these these are complementary things that we don't produce here on our farm but the the ripple effect going out uh is 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 lots of 
uh, dollars going into these um, neighbor to the neighborhood. So what what you end up with is you end up with a a community, um, uh, you know, a a significant community of of people who are um, who are you know trying to uh, work on you know artisanal artisanal and craft type uh, food and fiber, and um, you know it, it takes a it it, 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 ta it takes an eclectic bunch of people you know working together to build that kind of community. But the whole the whole goal is to have a uh, a community that can offer a uh, hope and help when the world despairs in hopelessness and helplessness, we want to be a place of hope and help when the world acts hopeless and helpless. Yeah, do, so it's, do you think um, you have been able to include people from your community that were from unemployed groups, vulnerable groups? Um, have you been able to include them in the community through your activities? Well, uh, look, we don't we don't make a point of 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 trying to of trying to write all of the whatever social injustices of the past. Um, every, every we have all sorts of people come. Um, we don't ask them how much money they make. We don't ask them if they're employed. We don't ask them what their religion is. Uh, we don't ask them what they believe. Uh, we, we are, we are uh, open for all comers. Um, uh, certainly, you know, when we, have, when we have extra things, sometimes that we can't sell, we take them to the local homeless shelter to, to, to provide, you know, food for, for folks down there. Uh, we routinely... Uh, reach out to people who are in, uh, you know, uh, uh, in trouble for whatever reason, whether it's, you know, a physical impairment. Uh, I mean, we, we've, we've delivered food to doorsteps of, of somebody, you know, a, that's an invalid or, or uh, who, who suddenly, you know, had a death in the family, can't get away. Um, uh, I mean, we, we have done charitable outreaches, uh, over the years, I mean, I, I, I you know, I, I don't keep a record of them. I, I don't. Oh, I was, I was good today. You know, I don't keep a tick mark for, you know, for for seeing uh, needs. But we have certainly, um, you know, provided uh, those kinds of things. L let me just say one other thing on that. Uh, one of the neat things about about our environment, what the, one of the things that we've done here at the farm is created a community where all all of our team members. So we have we have about. You know, about 25 of us who earn a living here from the farm. And, and as I mentioned, those aren't all hardcore farmers. You know, some are uh, mechanics and maintenance and truck drivers and, you know, and different things, uh, salespeople. But we welcome all, we, we have a very family friendly environment. So people can, can, can work here and bring their children. A and so, um, so, we don't have the, you know, the moms who have little children who work here, their kids are not in daycare. Uh, we, we, the, the office is set up with uh, toys and play pens and, and safe places to where our, to where our team members um, uh, feel welcome as a whole family, as, as a whole uh, unit. Uh, and, and that way they don't, they don't have to pay for daycare. They don't have to be separated from their children and their children actually grow up as they get a little bit of size to them, you know, seven, eight years old, the kids um, can, can go out on the farm and do their own exploring. Uh, they, they develop their own social friendships here. We, um, we, have, a, we have a farm school uh, that's primarily for um, our, our, our people and, and people in the community who want to use it, who, that, that, that essentially uses the farm as a, as a curriculum platform for the academics and uh, as the children get older. And so, um, uh, so you know, there's, there, there's a lot to this, um, 
you know, th that maybe doesn't fit right into the stereotype of, of you know, of ESG uh, thought today. Um, and, and if I say, I might say one more thing, this is a very safe environment. You know, we don't use, we don't put anything on the soil that you can't eat. Um, there, there is no, there's no room with a, with a skull and crossbones on it that says poison. Um, so it's, there, there's no manure lagoons. I've, I've never seen a child uh, drown in a compost pile. Uh, you know, you can climb on a compost pile, but, you know, as opposed to like a manure lagoon, I mean, think about the average large industrial farm with, with all of the, you know, the slurry systems, lagoons, poisons, uh, you know, hazmat suits. We don't have a hazmat suit on the farm because we don't use any hazardous materials. And, and so that, that makes a safe place for uh, uh, families. We have, a, we have a playground for children. So our customers who come and, and people who want to come, they, they can come here. There's, there's teeter-totters, tire swings, a rock box with, you know, with, with children's toys in it. Um, and, 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 you know, the, 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 the chicks are close uh, where, you know, kids are welcome to go out. We have no, no trespassing signs, no employees only signs. No, everything is open. Anyone can go anywhere. And so, it, you know, it's common to come. We've got picnic tables and to just see people out, enjoying the farm, you know, and, and that, that is a, that is a whole person, whole community mission, ministry to be transparent and open and welcoming for anyone uh, of, of any persuasion to come and enjoy, you know, enjoy the farm. Yeah, it definitely does seem like you're paying a very, um, good service to the well-being of, of your whole community through all of this that you're doing. Um, as we're moving towards the end of the interview, I wanted to ask you, how easily do you think that your model can be applied in other places in the world? Oh, I, I don't think that there's any problem anywhere in the world. Now, obviously, you would have cultural, um, you know, cultural, whatever, you know, customized uh, uh, because of climate, you know, weather, different things. I mean, goodness, um, you know, Por Portugal would be a wonderful place to apply this because your weather is so, you know, weather is so gorgeous. Um, uh, so, so yes, uh, th th with, with, at, with a regional adaptation, um, this absolutely could be applied. I, I think the, the prince, the, certainly the, the ecology, the ecological principles can be applied, but certainly the social, the social elements of where, where we're, we're trying to create, um, you know, a, a family friendly environment and, and, uh, minister to the, to the whole community with a, with a local, um, you know, a, a local theme, uh, all of that is quite repli replicable uh, anywhere in the world, in, in, in any culture. This is, not a, this is not a cultural or a climatic, um, you know, uh, special thing. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's quite duplicatable. Great. And uh, if for someone watching that is inspired by your words and your project, um, what could someone do to help or eventually get involved if they'd like to? Uh, well, the the main thing is to uh, is to I think to to participate uh, intentionally. You know we we tend to, so one of the ways to do this um, is to kind of look through. So imagine, imagine you're, you're getting ready to eat. And as you look at what's on your plate, just take a moment to squint, squint through the plate and try to imagine the landscapes that grew the food on that plate. Just imagine that landscape and then ask, is that landscape the kind of landscape I want my grandchildren to inherit? And 
so often we have this. So how can somebody help me? Uh, I the way to help me is to simply join join the awareness team, join the thinking team. You know, um, we we have this uh, notion. I think that our problems are, are so big. I'm so small. What can I do? There, there's a, there's a kind of a sense that, um, you know, what, what I do today doesn't matter, but the, but the fact is that where we are today on, on the planet, um, our, our track record, our stewardship, our, our, all of these things are a, a physical, a physical manifestation of trillions and trillions of little decisions that we and our ancestors have made for centuries and, and have created what we have. What we have is, a, is, is this is what it created. Well, in a hundred years, in a hundred years, the same thing will be true. The planet that we have, the communities that we build, those are gonna be a, an accumulation of all the decisions that we make between now and then as people. You know, do we, do we think it's important uh, the kind of food we have on our plate? Do we think it's important the kind of recreation we do? I mean, in, in America right now, the average, um, the average male between 25 and 35 years old spends 20 hours a week playing video games. Is that, is that a... A, 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 a legacy enhancing view, uh, uh, use of time. Um, you know, we just, we just played the Super Bowl, the, the big football match, the Super Bowl. Seven, what, um, I wrote it down, 7.6, 7.6 billion, not million, billion dollars were spent uh, gambling on who would win the Super Bowl. Do you know what 7.6 billion that's that's one million dollars for seven thousand six hundred farmers that's you know i i you know as as you start down here uh carolina the the the, the wonderful thing the, the the encouraging thing is to realize that we have all the resources we have all the knowledge we have all the money to fix everything that we've destroyed we the, those are not the problem. The, the problem is between our ears. It's, it, it's, it's, it's character and it's constipation of imagination. It, it, <laughs> that, that's, that's our weak link. That's our weak link. And so, you know, how can somebody help me? Uh, I just say, you know, get your mind, get your head, get your heart uh, wrapped around the 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 privilege the honor of of knowing that these hands and these this intellect can engage can participate with healing um and and if more people would understand that 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 privilege and responsibility we would have a different world Thank you so much for this wonderful final message and, and for all of the other um, insights that you've led us on throughout this interview. Um, for anyone wanting to, to learn more about Polyface Farm, we're going to drop the link in the description, as well as uh, Joel's blog, Musings of a Lunatic Farmer, which is also very well worth taking a look at. Uh, and yes, next time, take a uh, careful look at your plate and where your food is coming from. And thank you again so much, Joel. It was a real pleasure just talking to you for this little bit. Thank, thank you, Carolina. The honor, the honor was all mine. <laughs> thank you.